Greetings friends, welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. Bring you a message today from two passages. First in Matt, well, both in Matthew, uh, from Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 28. And we speak today on a very important subject for all Christians, all true Christian churches, and for all those who profess to be missionary minded. There were commissions that were given to the church at Jerusalem. Now the Great Commission is what we most commonly hear talked of, but it was not the first commission given to the Lord's Church of Jerusalem. The first commission given to that church of Jerusalem is found in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, where he says here, These twelve Jesus sent forth, commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the, any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then the Great Commission, found in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16, we read there, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee, unto a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We would consider today these two commissions given to the Church of Jerusalem and their relevance to each other and how that they were to be carried out. First, we consider there as it spoke of in Matthew chapter 10. He told them there in verse 6, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We know from what Christ spoke in other places, he said he was first sent to them. He first had come to Israel. And my friends, we know that this was necessary to fulfill the scriptures. That Israel, he, he first come unto his own people, beseeching of them that they might repent and turn to him. And it, it was prophesied that they would not, they would not have him to rule over them. They would reject him and that they would kill him, and, which indeed they did. This was all had to come to pass. But he told them at that time, to do, he, do this, he said, As ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That kingdom, that to his coming and his power was at hand, but his ministry on earth, here, here on earth, had to be completed first. But in this, they were not to do. As he said, go not unto the way of the Gentiles, and enter, enter not into the city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, for we as Gentiles, those Gentile nations, we were still strangers to the covenants of promise. We were still without hope and without God in the world. And we, were, we knew these, uh, even though there were proselytes, there were the strangers, there were those Gentiles that had come there and to learn the Jewish religion, and uh, they'd have to uh, be declared a Jew first and all this, but still they were always separated. You had your Jewish people inside the temple, and you had to court the Gentiles where the Gentiles could worship. They were always looked down. They were never looked upon as being equals with the Jews in their worship with God. Uh, Matthew 15, 24 says unto us, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was sent first unto them. This had to be fulfilled, my friends. Had to, uh, the prophecies had to play out. They all had to be fulfilled. He had to walk the course of his life and keep the whole uh, letter of the law, every jot and tittle, which he did, fulfilling all the prophecies and all the sayings related to him and the law and the prophets and the Psalms and all these things. Christ fulfilling all things, yea, even unto his very death and resurrection, he fulfilled all that was said that should come to pass of him. And before that, he had told those, his twelve, first the twelve, to go unto the lost sheep of Israel, just go unto Israel, not unto the Gentiles or to the city of the Samaritans, not to go unto them, but only to the children of Israel. For that's who first God dealt with. First, God dealt with them that they, and that they would fulfill even what was set before them to do. Luke chapter 9 verse 5 tells us, And wheresoever, whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. He's talking about against the nation of Israel itself, against those Jewish people 
that for those cities and ones that said, get, you know, get away from us, we don't want you. You, you draw, caused our herds to go into the ocean and, and all died, the things that came to pass. And you know, the, the, the miracles of men being set free from the demons and the devils ought to cause them to want him to be there and all the healing, all the work he did, ought to cause them to want to him to be there and rejoice God in this. But no, because it would cost and was costing them profit, costing them their uh, possessions and their livelihood at times. They did not want Christ. Oh, how it is even in this day and time that there are those that don't want to forsake their worldliness and the profit that they gain from this world for Christ and, his, and service toward him. But it was not just the twelve. That he sent forth. We read in Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 1 of the 70, that he also sent forth. And after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. Now take note of that. He's sending them ahead of where he's going to go to. Uh, Speak of him, speak, speak of the coming of the kingdom of God. And uh, they gave him these abilities. He speaks of verse 12. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers unto the harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Oh, it is still true that even this day and time, there's still a harvest out there, my friends. And we need to pray for laborers. We need to pray for those that are willing to reach out to their neighbors, uh, willing to go out in their communities and tell people about Jesus. And we need to pray for men that God might raise up godly men to lead his churches. And that God might raise up godly men that uh, would go to foreign mission fields and to preach unto the, the strangers and those other regions beyond where we're at here even. And that the word of God will continue to go forth, for it has to go into all the world to fulfill the will of God. And I believe indeed it pretty well has in this day and time. It goes unto all the world through this medium, through the internet. Uh, it can go, and it is going unto all the world. People from all around the world could view this video and gain wisdom and instruction from the word of God and learn of these things. He says there to them about those that would receive them. And Luke chapter 10, going on down there to verse 10, he said, But unto whatsoever city ye enter, and, rec and they receive, ye, receive you not, go your ways out unto the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, but I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable in the day of judgment for, uh, for Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and then for that city. Be more tolerable in that day. He's referring to the day of judgment for Sodom than for that city. Think about that. More tolerable. And he goes on to say more of this, where he says, Woe unto thee, Chariz. Woe unto thee, Bethesda. For if the mighty works had been done in Troy and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great wall over repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Troy and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And now Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shalt be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you heareth me, he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. There are a lot of very important things which he's set before us here in this text here. That we might grasp this very concept that we all know of the destruction of Troy, Sidon, Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities there. He's referring to Troy and Sidon. Part of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the judgment was poured out upon them because of their wickedness. And that if the works which God had done here in the presence of these cities and places in this time, where he's gone unto, and that it rejected him, told him, no, we don't, we don't want you here. If those things had been done in those places, they'd have repented a long time ago, yea, would still be there. They'd have turned to God. 
that shows you the mercy of God is to whom he will have mercy, and he'll have judgment upon whom he'll have judgment. God is saving those that he wants to save, and under those cities, as he said, the cities where I'm going to go, that's where I'm sending you. It wasn't going under the Gentiles yet, not under the city of the Samaritans yet, but only to the children of Israel to seek the lost sheep, the lost children that are amongst them. For not all Israel is Israel. Those hypocritical leaders, Pharisees and different ones, as he speaks to them, if they are striving to go in, but would forbid the citizens, forbid others to enter in, and that is they are holding on to the truth of God's word and not manifesting it, not declaring it to the people. My friends, we have that in our day and time. We have had for a long time. Those that hold the truth and unrighteousness, that keep it back, have, that have not wanted the truth, the word of God, in the hands of the common people, they have resisted that. They fought against it. They made laws against it. They killed people that tried to do it. But it was the will of God, and they could not stop it. And that's why we have it today. And once they realized they couldn't stop it, they said, well, let's muddy the waters. Let's make our own copy. And then they have encouraged more and more and more and more versions of it to be published, to muddy the water so that you have hundreds of Bibles to pick from. You don't know which one is the true Word of God. And all those scholars that publish these things and put them out, they'll, they'll not put their full confidence and faith in any one of them. So they always hold back the idea, well, there's still something to be found. There's still something to be learned. Still something to be added to it. There's still some purifying of it to make it better than what we have. Well, if this be true, then God has failed us. For he said his word would endure even to the end of the world. And it has. We have it. We just have to believe by faith that we have it. It is in, to the English-speaking people, it is in this King James Bible. Not the New King James either. Because it's corrupted. Nor any of these other translations. But the King James is sure and steadfast. You can depend upon what it says. I don't care what they say. Let them have their doubt. Let them run in fear. They do not listen to their doubt and their hesitation to confirm the word of God and to live by it. We must live by these things. The word of God is to be sent forth and we're to take it. And we must have confidence in what we have, for they did. These, uh, well, 82 total roughly that he sent out, the 12 plus and 70 more, that he sent out and two by two, and that they have miracles and things which they work, and to do unto the people that they might know that God's with them. And they did those things in those days. And for some time it would continue on. And by those things they knew the kingdom of God was nigh unto them. And then as he spoke up there that verse 16. He that heareth you heareth me. He that despiseth you despiseth me. And he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. You cannot reject Jesus Christ. If you reject Jesus Christ you reject God the Father. And you have neither one of them to support you and to aid you. You must acknowledge that Jesus is, and that if you call him a liar, in a sense you are, if you say that Jesus is just God, and there is no other God, and there's no one else but just him, and he's referring to himself in an, another sense, then he's a liar. He's a deceiver. If there was not literally a father whom he spoke of, then he's a liar and a deceiver. And if there was not literally a third person being that Holy Spirit, but he would sin, to be with his people after he went away, then he's a liar and a deceiver, and he's not Savior. To believe these things is not to believe the truth. We must believe what the Word of God sets before us and teaches us, and we must go and take it to the world. Taking the gospel message of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that the world might see and believe upon him. And after all those things being fulfilled, and after he suffered and died, and arose again, my friends, that third day, after that, he gave them that second commission, that great commission, to go unto all the world. For God himself had rent the veil, tore down that uh, division between the high priest that was appointed by the law according to man, or according to the law of God, that a man that would be the high priest. He tore the veil between him and the people. And he also destroyed that wall of division between the Jews and the Gentile people. So that we can all now come together as one people worshiping God in spirit and truth, and crying to him, Abba, Father, for we have all been adopted into the family of God. We are all the children of God, Jews and Gentiles alike, that are true believers of him in and through Jesus Christ. And those Jews 
that still deny Christ, they have not the Father. And as long as they stay in that state, and if they die in that state, they have no hope of going to heaven. And the same to all Gentiles that refuse to acknowledge the Son of God and believe upon Him and trust that He is pointing you to the Father and that He sent you a Holy Spirit, the Trinity of God. And we were commanded in that commission to baptize, to teach, to teach, to teach in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This great commission, and we must go. And that's the most important part of this that we're emphasizing today is that we are to go. He said, "Go ye therefore and teach all nations." Whereas before it was just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but now it's unto all, unto all mankind. They are to go. Going to all nations. Oh, this is a hard thing. Hard thing for, you know, the, the attitude, and you can see it in the writings and other things, that their attitude and the, the attitude from the days of old was that those heathen nations, they're to be trodden underfoot. They have no hope. They know not God. God's laws and covenants are not for them. And indeed, up to this point, they weren't. But now it is a New Testament. It's a new covenant. And which, in truth, it's the old. It is, in a sense, it's the first covenant because it goes back before the foundation of the world, before the law was given even. That God revealing and manifesting these things in these times and through His Son Jesus Christ, that God before the foundation of the world had determined to save a people for His name's sake. And he had had, he, he, God being outside of time, looking upon all this, was able to plan it all out and purpose it out, determining the very end of it all before the beginning. Saving whomsoever we will, not because of themselves, but because of him. But they were commanded, the Lord's true churches, the church of Jerusalem, all those who followed after her, were commanded to teach and to go into all nations and teach them, to preach unto them the word of God, preach that gospel. And those things which followed after them, they were to carry out. Now there were no restrictions. There was not a particular group of people they say, well, these people over here, because of the way they look, don't go to them. Or these people over here, because they're the descendants of so-and-so, don't go to them. Or are those people down there, because of this or that. Oh, they're in the south, southern hemisphere, we can't go to them. Or they live way up north, we can't go to them. No, it's unto all nations, every single nation, I don't care what color you are, what uh, size, shape you are, what color your hair is, whether you lived in the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, and to all nations, they were commanded to go and send forth the gospel, the good news that the Savior, the Messiah, had come and had indeed redeemed his people from their sins and had risen from the grave. He gained victory over death, hell, and the grave, and had all power given unto him. And because he has all power, we know that he has control of all these things. And because he has been victorious over death, hell, and the grave, we too know that in and through him we have that victory also, we who trust in him for our salvation. That in and through him we have salvation, and not through any other, and not through anything we do. He said there, and, and it says in Mark chapter 16, 15, and he said there, uh, and sa uh, said unto them, Go ye unto all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. What does that mean by that? Does that mean every living thing, even the animals? No. He's talking about mankind. He came to redeem man, to redeem fallen man from his sinful condition. And there are those that try to apply that to others. Uh, first of all, the animals have no sin. They have not a, they have a, they're not like man. They're not made in the image of God. They don't have a trinity. They don't have a body, soul, and spirit. They just have a soul or spirit, which are, it's one thing compared to our the two parts, they've got a body and the living force that's in them. But there is no uh, likeness of God there. They were made to be for us, to live off of and use in this world. And that those things that are not of this world, that righteousness doesn't pertain to them either. Those fallen angels, there is nowhere in Scripture where he says that he died for the angels, even though some statements of faith imply that, but it's not set forth anywhere in the scriptures, my friends. In Luke chapter 14, verse 16, he said unto them, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and made 
and bade many, and sent his servants out at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, and all for all things are now ready. And and they with all and the, and they all with one con consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and must needs go and see it. I pray thee excuse me. And another said, I have five yoke of oxen and go to prove them. Pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that the servant came and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house began to be being, house being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the hilt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out unto the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. That, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. That's a parable of the kingdom of God. That there were those that were bidden that Christ went to and preached unto them the coming of the kingdom of God and they refused it, they rejected it, they would not have it. And because, and we can see it, that he turned to the Gentiles because those that were closest to him that he'd be in to come, they wouldn't come. With all the excuses they had. And still yet, even today, of all walks of life, we have people that have these excuses because they've got lands and property they need to go uh, and see to. Uh, they've got livestock, animals, and things they need to go see to. Or they're married, and, well, they're just so caught up in married life, they have no time for God. This, and we want to go out and please ourselves and pleasure ourselves. We work all week and on the weekends, or if we're off on the weekends, we just want to go out and have fun. Go out and lay in the sun, go fishing, go all these things that God is not considered in our walk of life. Say to you that we judge ourselves unworthy of the things of God and that uh, you have your inheritance. Unless you repent and turn to God, you'll not have anything else but this life. But the judgment of God waits and will abide upon you. We must repent and turn from our sins, and the gospel must go forth. We must go unto the world and proclaim unto all people, and they must needs repent and turn to God. Uh, Luke 15, verse 4, he said, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go? And go after that which is lost, until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh, he cometh together with his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. My friends, right there is the difference. There are those that... With all that is proclaimed unto them, they see themselves as okay. They see themselves as just. And they don't see that they have a need to repent and to turn to God. But for that one out of a hundred that God causes them to see through the preaching and witness of the Word of God that they need to repent and turn to God and they see that and they sincerely repent and turn to God. God does not turn them out. They have a salvation set before them which is eternal and everlasting. And that is what we're to go forth and proclaim unto them, the gospel of salvation and repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. We must go. We must go unto the world and declare unto them the things of God and preach the gospel unto them, that those that, by the grace of God, will hear and believe and repent and turn from their walk of life, whereas if they've been going toward their desires and their goals and toward destruction, my friends, they'll turn from that self, turn from self, turn to God and Go toward Him, strive to please Him, to live for Him, and do all things for Him, and their goal being to be with Him in heaven. And leaving all this world behind, for you cannot take any of it with you. It will all be destroyed, every bit of it. All those treasures, all those collectibles, all those things we store up and save for ourselves, even all the junk that's in the attic, all the junk and stuff that's in the storage buildings and the extra rooms of our mighty houses, all of it's going to be destroyed. All of it's going to be left behind and for naught. We spend our lives accumulating it. 
and not valuing the word of God and that which God has sent unto us and through those he sent forth. They went out, my friends. From the day on, God's people have been going forth, been going out in the world. Mark chapter 6 and 12, verse 12 says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. Mark uh, chapter 16 and verse 20 says, And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Romans 10, 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Oh, how beautiful they are. Those men of God had come unto me in my younger days and preached unto me the word of God. I don't remember the name of the minister that was preaching the sermons that week that I was saved. It was a revival. Remember we had Brother, Brother Peyton was our pastor in those days. But I don't remember who the evangelist was or the minister that was preaching in those days. But I do know this, I was saved that week. Say by the grace of God caused to realize my need of the, my Lord and my Savior and I could not keep it to myself. I had to go up and profess belief and salvation in the Lord. My trust in Him for my salvation. Not in myself, not in anything I could or would do, but trusting in the Lord for my salvation. And my life's never been the same since. And praise God for that. But thanks be unto God for all those other men of God that I've been able to sit under and listen to that have taught me the word of God and that that desire which God has put within me to stand and proclaim the word of God that others might hear and believe also. But there are those also that went out from us. The Bible speaks of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Not everyone that comes nigh unto you in these days and times, my friend, is someone who truly represents the Word of God. There are many who are doing this for their own glory, for their own gain. They want you to send them your wealth, your money, and uh, proclaim all of you will send me a dollar. God will give you a hundred. That's a prosperity gospel, and God doesn't teach that in the Word of God. If you're giving just that you might get more, you're doing it for the wrong reason. First of all, we ought to give our tenth or the tithe because God commands it to be done. And then we ought to give offerings for the work also above and beyond that for the work of God, for the work of the ministry to support the mission works and the pastors. These things ought to be done for the glory of God. And those that turn from these things to preach doctrines and gospels contrary to the word of God, my friends, we need to be weary of them. We need to turn from them and turn to the truth and the true word of God. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16 declares, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He is Jesus the Christ and he sent his angel, his messengers, to give that which he would have the pastor declare unto you in his churches, plural. We, his true churches, are the ones who have that responsibility to continue to take this gospel message to the world. And my friends, I'm out of time. May God bless you. May God bless his word. Till we meet again.